talking about what Brexit means for the UK economy. Well, earlier today, I spoke to Pascal Lamy, who is the former Director General of the World Trade Organization, and he told me that a hard Brexit is the most likely option and the most pragmatic option for Britain and the rest of Europe. I wouldn't have thought that the day after the referendum, where there were several options available. I think what we've learned since is that the only working assumption is hard Brexit, and there is not much time to do that. Uh, assuming the UK triggers uh, the start of the process in March next year, there's roughly a bit more than a year available for the negotiations about the divorce under very strict time limits, because there will need to be a time for ratification by the European Parliament and by the European Council. Uh, so very tough divorce proper negotiation and no time to really negotiate what matters, which is the future sort of cruise relationship uh, between UK and, uh, and the uh, remaining EU27. Uh, you said that a hard Brexit is the option that you think is most likely. Is that because the UK government has said that they want some controls on immigration and as a result, in your opinion, there won't be any access to the single market? That's technically correct. Uh, the reason why I think uh, hard Brexit prevails for the moment is that it's, it's the only way for the Prime Minister to keep the Tories united uh, between those who want to exit at any cost and those who want to remain and who believe that if the cost is really high, then there might be a second thought or bite. So that's the political sort of tactical reasons why hard Brexit is probably the only assumption for uh, Theresa May, and you have the reverse on the continent. Most governments on the continent have some part of their public opinion who's turned Eurosceptic or even anti-European, like the Front National in France or the Alternative für Deutschland in uh, Germany. And of course, they don't want these people to have a case. So the harder the Brexit, uh, the more the example will be uh, that going in this direction is not right. So there is a sort of tactical coalition which leads to this only, I think, available assumption, which, as you said, uh, is clearly leaving, including the internal market, including the financial passport and the damage this will create on the City of London and, and so on. For other tactics from other EU countries and European uh, leaders more to do with punishing the UK to make sure no. that no other country wants to leave? No, I don't think there is any view among uh, remaining EU27 that it, the UK should be punished. I, I don't think at all that's the case. But they don't want to be punished by their own Eurosceptic or anti-European who are a minority for the moment, let's say. 20% of public opinion, but they don't want this to grow. So it's, it's a purely domestic issue they have in mind, as could be expected. After all, uh, these uh, political leaders are not elected by uh, Europeans, they are elected by nationals. Only the European Parliament or the European Commission is, uh, is elected uh, indirectly by, uh, by European citizens. The negotiations are going to be pretty tough when they uh, begin. What do you make of Theresa May's charm offensive uh, among other EU leaders? I, I can understand why uh, the, the British Prime Minister uh, does not want to show her hand. I mean, if, if I'm a negotiator, and I was a negotiator for the last part of my life, I mean, no, you, you, you don't open your game. And just finally, you are very involved in the French bid for the World Expo 2025, one of the most outward-looking things you can imagine, a world fair, effectively. Are you worried about the inward-looking nature of the French presidential election, particularly with uh, the isolationist policies such as Marine Le Pen? Yes, I am, which is why I accepted this government job of uh, preparing uh, for the Paris uh, bid 
for the Expo uh, 2025, uh, because I, I personally believe that you know, France is a country that is a sort of universal mind. They want to talk to the world. Uh, they have idea for the rest of the world. Sometimes it's a bit arrogant or a bit superior, but they have, they have a sort of world mind. And I think that's a good thing. And launching an invitation to uh, the rest of the world in 2025 is a good way to sort of reconcile French public opinion uh, with the world we live in. I'm not saying it's a perfect world, uh, but I still believe it's a much better world than uh, 20, 50 or 100 years ago. So looking to 2025 is a good way uh, for France to look positively at the future. And, you know, you don't invite people you don't like. OK, Pascal Ami, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. My pleasure.